Well, good morning. It's good to have each one of you with us today. To our members, it's good to see each one of you. To our visitors, we are excited that you've come our way today. We want to invite you to come back and worship with us here at Pyburn Street anytime that you may have the opportunity to do so. As Brother Mike mentioned during the announcements earlier tonight, or earlier uh, in our in our service today, tonight is our question and answer night, and so I want to invite all of you that can to come back tonight at six o'clock. We have four questions that we're going to be looking at this evening. And I think it will be a very good, very fruitful study for all of us. So if you're able to be back tonight at 6 o'clock, we encourage you to do so. But it is good to have each one of you with us. Good to have some back with us that have been out sick. and glad that you're doing better, able to be with us today. There is no one who is in more need of a true friend than one who is lost in sin. In God's Word, we find a picture of Jesus. And Jesus is pictured as being a friend of sinners. He walked with them, talked with them, ate with them, and did this so much so that it drew criticism from the scribes and the Pharisees. In our lesson text that Brother David shared with us just a moment ago in Luke 15, verses 1 and 2, It says that all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Well, while these religious leaders of the day were more concerned about their reputation, we see that Jesus was more concerned with the souls of those who were lost. He was more concerned with reaching out to those who had legitimate needs. He was there for those who needed him, regardless of what what may have been taking place in their life at the time. And therefore, we see that he wasn't too concerned about the charges that they were levying against him. In fact, in another passage, Luke 7 and verse 34, they even went so far as to say, Look, he is a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But Jesus gave no concern to this. He really wasn't concerned with what the false teachers of the day had to think of him so long as he was fulfilling his ministry. Well, the scriptures declare in James 4 and verse 4 that friendship of the world is enmity with God. But we see in Jesus Christ a man who was able to walk that fine line. A man who left us an example of how to be a friend of someone who is worldly, but not be a friend to their worldly behaviors. He was able to have cordial relationships with those who were living lives of sin without condoning the things that they were doing. Folks, we too need to learn how to walk that fine line. We too need to learn how to be the friend of sinners. Well, in response to the criticism that Jesus had levied against him, we find in Luke chapter 15 that he gives us three parables. The first of which is found in verses 4 through 7. And in this parable, he tells the story about a man who had a hundred sheep, and one of those sheep has gone astray. It's lost out in the wilderness. Well, we notice that the shepherd didn't just throw up his hands and say, Oh, well, I have 99 more. I'm not concerned about the one that is lost. No, he left behind the ones that he knew were safe and secure. And he went out and he searched. And he found that sheep. When he found it, he rejoiced. He placed the sheep on his shoulders and he brought it back to that place of safety. Brought it back to the sheepfold. But notice he didn't stop there. He was rejoicing and he called all of his friends, called all of his neighbors, invited them to come over and rejoice with him. He says, rejoice for I have found my sheep that was lost. But then Jesus adds this. He says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Well, then he goes into his second parable. 
And here Jesus refers to an item that was lost. He starts out with a sheep, part of a person's livelihood. Well, now he talks about a woman who has lost a coin. And we notice in verses 8 through 10, he says, Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece... And most scholars are in agreement that what this is in reference to was a day's wage. This one piece, this one piece of silver that she lost was the equivalent of a day's wage. And anyone that has ever gone through life having to live paycheck to paycheck, you know what a struggle that is if you lose even one day's wage. Well, this lady, it says that she has lost one piece. And she says, what woman, or what woman having ten pieces, if she loses one, does she not light a candle? Does she not go through the house and search for it diligently until she finds it? And when she hath found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. But then, possibly, the most popular, most beloved parable that Jesus ever taught comes next in verses 11 through 24. It's a parable about a lost boy, sometimes referred to as the prodigal son. This young man, he leaves his father's home and he goes off into a far country And there he wastes his funds, his friends forsake him, and he is reduced to the position of serving as the slave of a Gentile, going out into the field and feeding pigs. A position that was well below the dignity of a Jew. Well, after a while he's there and and he's so hungry that he even begins to contemplate eating those scraps that were there to be provided for the hogs. But then in a statement that is hands down one of my favorite statements in all of the scriptures and I think speaks so much to us even today, he came to himself. He came to realize the situation that he was in and he knew there was a way out of it. He knew there was a way to change that. And so he decides that he's going to return home. But he's not going to ask his father to restore his sonship. He's not going to ask his father to bring him back into the family and bless him in any way other than as a hired servant. Well, as he returns home, immediately we see his father's concern for this young man. We see this this heartwarming welcome where he runs out. He falls upon this young man and he kisses him and, and he begins to shower blessings upon him. Folks, we cannot help but see in this the tender and deep feelings that Jesus has toward one who is in sin. When that one decides that they are ready to come home and leave that life of sin behind, notice the reaction of the father. But the father said to his servants, this is verses 22 through 24. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The father was rejoicing. Now not everyone was happy about this. We see that the older brother resented the father's actions, resented his younger brother for wasting his inheritance and then having the nerve to come back home. How dare he show his face around there again? This sinner. But the old man, the father, he would not allow his joy to be quenched for his lost child had come home. The celebration continued regardless of what the older brother thought. Folks, we see that Jesus gave some of his most scathing rebukes to the scribes and the Pharisees 
when they criticized his friendship with sinners. For Jesus explained in Luke 5, verses 31 and 32, He says, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, it is truly a sad, sad day when a Christian is no longer moved with compassion on a person who is lost in sin. Jesus gave us a powerful example of how our friendship with sinners can actually help us to seek and to save that which was lost. But not only do we see Jesus pictured in the Scriptures as a friend of sinners, He's also shown to be the Savior of sinners. The angel told Joseph in Matthew 1 and verse 21, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then at the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus, Jesus comes to the Jordan to be baptized by John. John looks up and he sees him coming. And he makes that powerful declaration, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. But then Jesus even declared himself that his earthly ministry had a purpose. And in Luke 19 and verse 10, he said that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to this earth to be the Savior of sinners. To save the souls of those who are lost. And we, you and I, each one of us have great cause for rejoicing in the fact that Jesus is the Savior of sinners. You know why? Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Because we all are in need of the saving power of the gospel which Jesus came, shed his blood on the cross, gave his life to make available to us. We all need it. And we all can rejoice in that fact. And we look at the words of Paul in Romans 5 and verse 8 where he says that God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice he doesn't say while you were righteous, Christ died for you. Notice it doesn't say while you were trying to live right, while you were trying to live the Christian life, then Jesus was willing to die for you. No, it says while you were still living in sin, while you were still lost, Jesus came and gave his life for you to give you the opportunity while we were still living in blatant rebellion to the will of God. God sent His Son to die for us. If we turn to Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6, we find the prophet saying that we all, that includes you and me, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of of us all. Folks, what that means is that once we reach the age of accountability, we all commit sin. Sin enters into our life, and without a Savior, we would be lost. God sent His Son to be that Savior. And when He was nailed to the cross of Calvary, we see the climax of mankind's history. For in this event, we see God's love demonstrated. We see His desire to save souls demonstrated. Folks, the cross is the reason that Jesus came to earth. He says He came to seek and to save that which was lost, but He could not save them without the cross. He died to overcome Satan, to set us free from the bonds of sin. And he was raised from the dead on the third day. Why? So that he could be the mediator between us and God. He shed his blood so that we could be cleansed from our sins. A man who was sinless, that was blameless, was nailed to the cross for you and I. So that our sins could be taken away. So we could be kept free from sin. 
If we go back to the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, we find the description of the beginning of man. In Genesis 1 and verse 26, God says, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And then if we skip over into chapter 2 and verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Of all of the creations of God, we see that man is unique. For only man was created in the image of God. And to understand the importance that Jesus places upon the soul of man. We need to look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26. Where he says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Simply put, Jesus says, Is there anything in this whole wide world that is worth losing your soul over? He says, Even if you gain the whole world, is that really worth losing your eternal destiny? Is it really worth forfeiting your soul to have the things of this world? Well, folks, whenever we come to recognize that great possession that God has given to each one of us, it should motivate us to want to save it forever. When we realize that God has placed a little part of us, or a little part of Him inside of us, He made us a spiritual being. When we realize what God has done for us, why would we ever want to lose that? Why would we ever want to forfeit that soul? We see that our spirit is of great value to God. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20, he says, we were bought with a price. What is that price? It's the body of Jesus. The body of Jesus. Well, the concern that Jesus had for those who were lost, it's clearly seen in Mark chapter 6 and verse 34, where it says, And Jesus, when He came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And He began to teach them many things. Folks, they were blind to God's love and to their own spiritual need. They were wandering around lost in need of guidance. So what did Jesus do when He came out and He saw all of these people living in sin? Did He condemn them? No. Did He avoid them for fear that it might hurt His reputation? No. The text says He had compassion on them. This word that's translated compassion literally means to feel with. So literally what this is saying is that Jesus felt for them. He understood what they were going through. He recognized their lostness and the fact that they were without a purpose in life. They needed a shepherd. And so to them, Jesus became the good shepherd. In fact, Jesus would later make the statement in John 10 and verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So not only did Jesus see the value of the soul and was willing to be the Savior of each sinful person, Jesus saw something else. Jesus saw the potential in people. When Andrew brought his brother to meet Jesus, Jesus saw in this simple fisherman the qualities that would eventually lead him to becoming the Apostle Peter. Jesus did not look at Peter as he was. He looked at Peter as what he could be. And you know, there are so many other examples that we could look at. Jesus referred to James and John as the sons of thunder. Literally what that meant was that these were men of a fiery disposition. 
But yet, he saw in these two men the ability to mellow out and eventually have the disposition that they needed in order to be apostles. We find another interesting story in John chapter 4. Here Jesus strikes up a conversation with a Samaritan woman. And evidently this woman was living a quite sinful life. And Jesus begins talking to her, reveals to her things that no one else knew about. Things that she had never told a soul. But yet Jesus was able to reveal those things to her. And he went on to reveal to her the fact that he is the Christ. Now when we think about this woman... This was a woman that no respectable man, Jew or Gentile alike, would have been found speaking to this woman because of the kind of life that she was living. But Jesus saw possibilities in her that no one else was able to see. And after speaking with this woman, the text says in verse 39, she went back into the city. And she began to tell everybody about Jesus. She went back and and, and she told the people there that, that he told her everything she had ever done. He knew where she was at in life. He knew that she was not living as she should. But he saw in her a woman who could change. He saw in her a woman who had potential to do better in the future than she presently was. She went back and she told the people in the city about this. Well, they came out to meet Jesus. In verse 32, the people of the city, they said to this woman, Now we believe. We believe the things that you've told us, not because of thy saying, but because we have heard them ourselves. They go on to say, we know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now if Jesus had just avoided this woman, had passed her by, had not seen potential, had not taken the time to converse with her, those Samaritans would never have come to Jesus. They would never have placed their faith in Him. And we look at how many lives were changed as a result of Jesus being friendly to a woman in sin. But we think also that Jesus looked down from heaven. He looked upon this sinful world and He saw in us the ability to be better. He saw in man the ability to live for God. And not be devoted to the things of this world. And that's why he was willing to leave the joys of heaven. That's why he was willing to strip himself of all of the joys that were there. And the splendor of heaven. And come to this earth. Because he saw in us a potential. He saw in us a people that can change. He saw in us things that... We could not see ourselves. I want you to take for instance. We read in the book of Acts. About a fanatical enemy of God. A man who was described as making havoc of the church. Who even authorized or consented to the execution of Christians. But Jesus saw in this man Saul of Tarsus the beloved Apostle Paul. He saw in this man the potential to one day make the claim, for me to live is Christ. He saw in this man the potential to one day say, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I live, but Christ liveth in me. He saw in this man the potential To one day say, what things were gained to me, these have I counted loss for Christ. And because Jesus sees the same potential in you and I, He died for us. 
Jesus died for us because He saw in us the potential to be better. The potential to lay the world aside and live a life that's devoted to Christ. In John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we see Jesus speaking to Nicodemus and He says these famous words, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But notice what he goes on to say in the very next verse. Verse 17. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. We move over to the next book that the Apostle John wrote in 1 John 3 and verse 16. It says, by this we know love, because He laid down His life for us. Jesus, on one occasion, speaking with His disciples, He told them that He was about to go to Jerusalem. He had already revealed to them that that was the place and it was the appointed time that He was going to be put to death. And He made the statement in John 15 and verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this and to lay down his life for his friends. And very few passages describe what Jesus did for us and why he did it better than the verse I want to close with today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, Paul said, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Simply put, Jesus was moved to action on our behalf. And when we, like Jesus, recognize the value of the soul, when we see the potential that is there in other people, those people that were created in the image of God, then we too will be spurred to action, just as Jesus was. But the question that we need to ask ourselves this morning is, are we a lost sinner? Are we still wandering around lost in this world? Well, if so, I have good news for you this morning. You have a friend in Jesus. He loves you. He wants to save you. And He sees great potential in you. But I have more good news as well. Every member of this congregation is your friend. We love you. We want you to be saved. And we see potential in you as well. But only you can decide if you're going to accept the gift of salvation that Jesus died on the cross to provide for you? Are you willing this morning to place your faith in Him? To turn away from your sins? To come forward and confess that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and to be baptized for the remission of your sins and be added to the church? Or maybe you're here this morning as a child of God and you realize that you've not been living up to your potential. Well, Jesus sees in each and every one of us the potential of greater service. There's always more that we can be doing, always more growth that is there. It may be that you see that you've kind of grown stagnant in your faith. You've not really turned away from your faith, but you've not been living the Christian life to, your, to the fullest potential then let us, as your brethren and your friends, know this. Let us pray with you and encourage you as you strive to get your life right with God. Or if you've allowed sin to enter back into your life and to pull you away from God, come back today. Be restored to the faith. Repent of your sins. This morning, know this. You're among friends. You're among those who love you. You're among people who want to go to heaven and we want you to go with us. 
And so this morning, if there is a spiritual need in your life that we can help you with in any way, then we would invite you to come at this time while together we stand and sing.